Let's start off with something down to earth here before the video gets too floaty and astronaut-esque. Contours are one of the basic foundations that my sculpture is built around. Contour is essentially the outline of the figure from any given view. However, that gets to be really complicated really fast since we have, in theory, 360 outlines to make and accurately making those is probably impossible to accomplish, or at least it's going to be very time consuming. We also have other angles, of course, not only 360 degrees from the ground, but we have angles from above and below that will expand on those 360 angles. And so let's just not even go there. This is complicated enough, of course, and so in order to simplify, we're going to consider contours from four primary views. Those four views are going to be the front, the sides, and the back. And all of those four views are essentially oriented in a square around the figure. I'm going to be using the pelvis as the deciding factor in what is the front. So essentially the front plane of the pelvis is the front of my sculpture, the front plane, the first primary view. And then from there, I'll decide what is the side, 90 degrees to the front, and what is the back, 90 degrees to the side. This is why you will, in general, see footage on screen of those four primary views here. This is very simple first day stuff that we teach our students, and to their surprise sometimes, this doesn't really change no matter how good or, or technically proficient you get at sculpture. Or at least I never thought it would be a good idea to change it, so I haven't tried. But I think it's a really good idea to hold on to this concept of building contours and then allowing the sculpture to come from that. In addition to being the outline of the figure, it's important for me to note that the contour that is the outline of the figure is not sitting at the same place in depth when observed from one view. They actually move forward and backwards in relationship to us, and this is something that we have to contend with as well. This gets into a much more complicated territory, however, so I think we'll leave that one out for now. Uh, you can watch my, my video series on sculpting a female figure, a half life size female figure that you can find on Patreon if you're interested in hearing more about contours moving in space. This sculpture is much more complex than something our first year students will embark on, of course, and so there are some limitations to these four primary views that come up here in a sculpture like this. These are of course not lost on us at the academy and we have a strategy that we do teach people eventually when it comes to dealing with complex poses where four primary views are unlikely going to lend themselves to a successful sculpture, successful result. Since there is a big twist between the pelvis and the rib cage, which are the two big bony masses of the torso, we need to have two separate sets of four primary views. One for everything that belongs to the region of the pelvis. And one, one set of four primary views for everything that belongs in the region of the ribcage. In addition, we'll add one when it comes to the head as well, but that's going to be much later on. Now things are starting to get rather complex, since we have expanded from four to eight views, of course. The difficulty is often connecting these two bony masses together when working with two separate sets of primary views. In addition to that, I like to take separate sets of four views when it comes to limbs that don't conform to the primary views of the pelvis or the ribcage. Now, mostly when it comes to limbs, you're not going to be able to get four primary views, actually. You're usually going to get two or three. Because, for example, a leg has the inside of it covered by the other leg. And so we can only use the outside view, the front and the back, giving us three views for one leg. As you can see here on my sculpture, one leg is pushing inwards. That's the leg that's coming forward, the raised leg. Its knee is further in, meaning that if we use the views from the pelvis, I will get a foreshortened look at the leg. So I can adjust myself so that this doesn't happen and that I'm looking at the side of the leg without any foreshortening. Essentially, 90 degrees to the front plane of the knee is going to be the side view of this leg. Eventually here, I'll end up doing the same to the arms and I'll even adjust 
within one arm, from the upper arm to the lower arm, since the two are in such different position, the arm is bent. However, the thing to keep in mind here is that the basic concept remains the same. Observe on equal terms from one of four primary views. Even if that basic concept gets expanded upon and ultimately made incredibly complex, which is what we have going on here. Keeping with this concept is going to allow you to make whatever you need to make and always be able to observe it well. So, observing on equal terms and using four primary views to do so is a massive benefit when it comes to working using observation. The concept of structure is another basic fundamental that we hold dearly here at the Florence Academy of Art. Structure simply means that a three-dimensional form must maintain its solidity and three-dimensionality. So in other words, it can't be crooked. Now that sounds rather complex, but essentially it just means that something that needs to look or feel structural cannot look or feel crooked. It's going to be fairly simple in real life. However, it is going to be terribly difficult to implement and it's going to be even more difficult to maintain as we progress the work. In the early goings here, we are talking about the structure of symmetrical forms. And symmetrical forms are going to be our three bony masses, of which we have two represented so far. The pelvis and the ribcage are bony masses, and they are symmetrical. In general, when we talk about structure, this is the sort of stuff we're going to talk about, not a leg. We're not going to talk about the structure in the leg, because it is not symmetrical. It is different on either side if we split it in half. But the pelvis and the ribcage and the head are symmetrical on either side of the center line. So this is the basic premise that we are working under, and I know that the ribcage can move, but it's not going to be that much. What I mean by move is that if we breathe in, the ribs sort of expand further apart a little bit, but it's not a lot. And so instead we are going to simplify the ribcage, the mass of the ribcage a little bit, and I think that really is going to help us make sure that we have a structurally sound ribcage. That is, if we treat it as a bony mass that cannot move, even though it probably can move a little bit. This means that our bony masses are going to be symmetrical in width on either side of the center line. The ribcage has the same width on either side of its center line. The center line running down the middle on the front and the back view, of course. This does not apply to the side view. And the same thing is true for the pelvis. This means that as long as one of these bony masses reaches the surface, which it does in certain areas, right? The bones of the pelvis reach the surface around the iliac crest. And on either side of that, we're going to need symmetry and width. If muscles are on top of the bony mass, then we can have some variety in width on either side of the center line. But this variety is, again, very minute. And the asymmetry you will find will be a lot less than you could perhaps be led to believe when observing from life where there's a lot of information to take in. In addition to this equal width on either side of the center line through a bony mass, we have symmetry and contour on either side of the center line within a bony mass as well. This means that if we find a break in the contour on one side of the bony mass, we can instantly look to the other side and find the same angle break there. So why is this? It's because the bony mass is symmetrical on either side of the center line, which means that where the bones reach the surface on one side, we will find its opposite reaching the surface on the other side, perpendicular to the center line, of course. Not only that, though, muscles that attaches to the bony mass are going to be attached symmetrically across from each other as well. So as an example, the pectoral muscle or chest muscles are attached in the same way on either side of the ribcage. This means that once we have the center line running through the center of the ribcage, we can simply go 90 degrees out from the center line at the sixth rib, and this will be the bottom of the pectoral muscle. And it will be the same on both sides, no matter the pose, by the way. 
Now, I threw out some anatomical terms there, and I wouldn't actually go looking for the sixth rib or anything like that. I will usually use the width of the pelvis to find the bottom of the sternum, essentially taking the width of the pelvis, which I established early, flipping it vertically to find the bottom of the sternum. And once I find the bottom of the sternum, then I'll see how the bottom of the pectoral muscles relate to the bottom of the sternum on my model, and then I'll copy that relationship on my sculpture. In general, the bottom of the pectoral muscles are going to sit a little bit lower than the bottom of the sternum. And they're going to sit a little bit lower towards the outside as compared to in the center. 